me, please. Thanks, Russell. So we've got apologies from Sophie Black, Emma Colgate, Mike Flaxman, Phil Gilbert, Harker Mulheron, Graham Nuttall, Barty Patel, Pat Scott, Jim Sinnott, David Spraggett, Kathy Wagstaff, Sue Whelan Tracy, Sue Warner, Roger Weddle, John Holland will hopefully be joining us about 2.30. Thank okay, you. Um, thank you very much, Sarah. Any new declarations of qualification for office or declarations of um, interest? Could you please raise a digital hand for me? Uh, Sharon? Yeah, I've signed off the form uh, with Sarah. Um, just to let everybody know, I am actually a trustee and on the committee for the League of Friends of Warwick Hospital. OK, that's great. Thank you very much, Sharon. Um, anyone else? Sharon, if you could take your hand down, that would be great. OK, we'll move on then. As I said, the minutes of the meeting held on the 9th of November uh, will need to uh, formally ratify the next uh, meeting. Um, but are there any amendments um, that colleagues on the Council of Governors who are on the call today would like to make? Could you please raise a digital hand? I don't see any digital hands raised, so I'll take them as accurate subject to final ratification at our next meeting. Then in terms of um, matters arising, um, we have, um, just bear with me. It do go on so comprehensively done, are they? We did just have one, which was um, the safer discharge group and Adam was asked to check the outcome of the compliance with the criteria led discharges and feedback to governors. Um, Adam, you did that, did you not? Yes, we fed that back. Awesome. OK, super, thank you. Um, are there any matters arising that colleagues feel I've missed? OK, well, this part of the agenda is for me to make a, a few sort of remarks. Um, building on what I said earlier, we are incredibly busy at the moment and we do appreciate the forbearance of members of the public. Um, our A&D teams are very efficient with the work they do both, uh, particularly for um, our young people who come to us. Most people who come to an A&D um, are young people, um, but also our frail elderly. And, um, but we are... I think coping better than most when it comes to the industrial action. We are coping better than most when it comes to the general challenges of winter. And we are coping better than most, definitely, when it comes to our financial outlook, um, all of which we will touch on during the course of this agenda. Uh, we are still focused on our key priorities of working more closely with our ICB colleagues in terms of integrated care, particularly at place, and we will touch on some of that later. We continue to make very substantial investments, as you will have seen if you visited the site recently. Uh, the estates team under Sophie Gilk's uh, leadership are doing quite extraordinary things at squeezing a quart into a pint pot, to use vernacular, uh, whilst uh, moving things around um, the very constrained site that we have. So really great assets being laid down for the future. We don't get everything right all the time and we are very aware of that. And we do apologise when we do get things wrong. But generally, I think the citizens of Warwickshire can be proud um, of the trust and the work that it's doing day in, day out to look after your healthcare needs. So without further ado, um, and we've got the opportunity for questions later. We'll move on to the assurance items. And uh, Sara, thank you for standing in for um, Harkamel. Um, it's appreciated. Um, Harkamel's taking a well-deserved rest, and I'm sure you will make sure you take your holidays as well, Sarah. So the first is the future of cancer services in Warwickshire. Over to you, Sarah. Okay, so I'm a bit closer because my microphone can be a bit dodgy. Um, so the report is as read. So um, the report covers our current state, our current position of our cancer services. It also highlights some of the things that we've done to change the way we manage our um, cancer pathways to make the improvements. 
and it also looks to the future really so there is quite a lot of detail in there a couple of points i'd like to point out um the 28 day faster diagnosis standards which is the standard where we have to provide um either you've got a cancer or non-cancer diagnosis we have done some well the teams have done some remarkable work on actually getting us to the standard of 75 percent and we've sustained that for a few months you know for several months now in fact i think it's over a year um, and we're looking to improve that all of the time by, um, you know, looking at the way we manage patients through that pathway. We've also started a piece of work with the GP, so um, we're hoping we'll see those come through. We still have a little bit of work to do around the 60 due date pathway, but actually as a benchmark compared with other trusts, we're actually doing better than most. So it's not where we want to be, but we are, you know, and we're trying to improve all of the time. So that's it really. I don't know if there's any questions or if there's anything else you'd like me to pull out the report. Well, what worries you most uh, about our cancer services in Warwickshire? Um, I think some of the biggest challenges are reliance on other providers um, to provide some of the specialist diagnostic tests, some of the specialist treatments. Um, you know, when we've got control over our own pathways, it's remarkable what the teams pull out of the bag and what we can do, we can move at pace. But as soon as we have to rely on, um, you know, quite rightly because they provide the specialist care, um, then we can start seeing delays and that can be quite frustrating and a bit of a concern to be quite honest. So I think that's my biggest worry. It's the things I can't control rather than internally rather than the things that we can do internally. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Kelly. Yeah, and um, thanks, Russell. Uh, I just got two questions. One is um, the report says that the trust provides services for specific tumor sites. In these uh, sites, lung cancer, I don't think um, is shows there. Is the so the trust doesn't provide um, cover for lung cancer patients um, or these patients go no, elsewhere? We, no, we do provide cover for lung cancer. Um, we provide up to diagnosis, um, but obviously if they need surgery, then they go to one of the big cancer um, centres. So it's usually Coventry. If I've if I've admitted those from the report, that was my error. I apologise. Yeah, um, and 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 my second question is that um, with the uh, with Coventry, um, they I, I don't know. It seems like when they discharge patients that live in Coventry, because obviously community services in Coventry are not provided by the trust. North Warwickshire obviously is covered by the trust. Um, have there been any issues with these referrals? Because um, they, they impress, my impression is that when it comes to Coventry patients being discharged, um, maybe they liaise with them better than the community services that um, that SWIFT provides to cancer patients. Um, that's, I don't know if there have been any issues with cancer patients that obviously live in North Warwickshire or, but not so, in Coventry. That's my so question. It, right, I, I might need you just to explain, or maybe I don't understand. So are these patients that have been treated at Coventry, UHCW and then discharged? Um, I haven't been made aware of any um, issues. But obviously, if there are any issues and people are concerned, then, of course, I'm happy to take those and pick them up with my colleagues at UHCW as well, um, because we are working in a system and we are providing, we want to buy, provide the best care we can to all our patients, regardless of where they live. So if there are anything, then I'm happy to pick that up. Thanks, okay. Glenn. Thank you. Glenn, did you want to come in? Yeah, but the UHCW, as, as Sarah says, there are main tertiary part and they are, they are very used to providing services over that bigger patch and the discharge of those patients into into Warwickshire particularly um, in the confidential section later I'll talk a little bit more about a review we're undertaking across group of tertiary pathways just to make sure that we we're, we're absolutely getting the best uh, arrangements in place for our patients Thank you. And just just before we move off cancer and uh, move on to the junior doctor strike and impact on waiting lists, so, um, we are in the process of trying to recruit some of our own oncologists, aren't we? Yeah, we are. Okay, so fingers crossed that will help as well. So um, lots, yes. lots of investment going on in cancer services, um, and we will keep members of the public uh, fully briefed. Uh, members of the public, you're always very welcome to join 
us in our monthly board meetings where there's a lot more detail that we go into in terms of our operational review. Thank you, Sarah. So we'll move on then to the junior doctor strike action and the impact on waiting lists. OK, that's me again. So obviously the paper is read. Um, the industrial action so far has had impact on our services, but probably not to the same extent as other hospitals. Our operational teams and the clinical teams have worked really hard, hard and closely together to mitigate against losing, um, you know, cancelling patients or, you know, not being able to process, you know, get people into our clinics on time. The numbers are in there. It's more than we would like. But as I say, it could have been a lot worse compared with other trusts. And certainly we've maintained all our cancer services. We've maintained um, clearance of our waiting list backlog. So, you know, working together as a whole trust, actually, we have managed to mitigate a lot of the industrial action. We are at the moment planning for the next set of industrial action. Mm -hmm. And we're taking the same approach about um, putting our cancer patients first, mitigating any cancellations, um, and those plans are being developed at the moment. But obviously, there is a bit. I'll be, I wouldn't be fair to say there hasn't been an impact, but there has. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, and I, I would just like to uh, thank um, those uh, consultants and anaesthetists and and others who, during strike action, have, um, if you like, stepped up and helped us mitigate the the impact but you know again i would apologize to members of the public for every uh, number that's on that uh, chart that sarah's produced we may be better than others but it causes real distress to those people so uh, i i apologize on behalf of that and the third thing i just want to say before i pass over to glenn is um th this th this strike action in my view in my view undeniably cause a, causes a level of patient, either physical or emotional harm. So the sooner the strike action is resolved, and I know there are um, very passionate positions held, um, but the sooner this strike action is held, uh, the better it is for citizens and society's general health and well-being. Um, Glenn, anything you'd like to add to this item? Yeah, I certainly to concur with with what you you just said, Chairman, about the um, the efforts of other clinicians, uh, advanced clinical practitioners, nurses, therapists, lo lots of different disciplines, um, flexing to support the the gaps in junior doctors and also uh, the, the the consultant strikes we've had over the course of the year, but also to Sarah and her colleagues actually, because the operational impact of this of of cancelling patients, of rescheduling patients, of managing rotors making sure we haven't got any gaps uh, it has quite a burden on on our operational management teams as well as our clinical staff uh, and so it's great credit that we've managed to keep the show on the road and, and, and actually those levels of cancellation as, as you heard earlier are are quite small compared to other parts of the nhs this has almost become business as usual which is a really sad thing actually so um i very much hope this is the last period that we're going into where we're having to, to to manage the impact of another strike. No, absolutely, Glenn. And I am conscious and uh, of all of these industrial action and the planning around it slows down the transformation work, which I know Sarah and colleagues very much want to get on with. Um, John? I went down to the hospital on the days of the strike and I didn't notice any picketing. I didn't notice anybody outside. How wholehearted were the doctors in joining in the strike and did they all get involved? There's been quite a, a high level of um, of uh, particularly junior doctors being involved in, in, in the strikes. Um, and obviously we have to plan for, uh, for, for having no cover on those days because um, the the law associated with this means that we can't um, encourage or or confirm that individual members are not going to strike. So there was so there was quite a lot of take up nationally and locally of the strike. We didn't in the first wave of strikes we did have pickets outside the hospital. In these later um, episodes, they they tended to go to some some bigger areas where the TV cameras are. Let's put it that way. Uh, so so I think there was. Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham, for example, a lot of the junior doctors from around 
the Midlands went into there to, to show their support for the strike. So there is still a lot of support for the strike. And in terms of the vote itself, the junior doctors, it was around 70 percent take up of, of the vote. I just point out, I'd like to make that, that I dealt with the Transport and General Workers Union throughout the 1970s and 80s. Uh, they did destroy most of the companies in which their members worked. And they, in, in fact, destroyed themselves as well. And the BMA looked very much like the Transport and General Workers Union to me. They look very much as though they are politically motivated and they don't concern themselves with, it, with the interests of whatever organization they're now attacking, which now is the, is the National Health Service. So I'm very, I, I, I think you've got a very fierce enemy here, which is very badly motivated. Um, thank you for your perspective, John. Um, my suggestion is we sort of move on now. Um, and um, move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the update on Worcestershire Acute Hospitals and the Foundation Group. Um, Worcestershire, group, Worcestershire Acute, um, so that's Worcester, the Alex and uh, Kidderminster joined uh, the Foundation Group um, in October last year. Glenn, how's it going? Yeah, I suppose what the, the main... Um, interest for the Council of Governors here is the impact on on South Warwickshire Foundation Trust uh, uh, and so I'll talk about that I'll also talk a little bit about the onboarding of Worcester Acute into the group and and, and where we are with that um, probably firstly just to talk about how the group model itself is growing across the NHS there's a there's a lot more group arrangements and um, uh, and I think the good thing about our group is it's it, it's one of the leading arrangements um, in fact um, if anyone has a 45 minute spare, they could listen to a Health Service Journal podcast on the issue that I did a, a couple of weeks ago now. A lot of interest in what we're doing. I think with our group model, uh, it is a model that is based on organisations coming together, but keeping their sovereignty as we have, but having a common set of challenges and opportunities to share best practice. So that's why we started the group in the first place. Obviously, we started with Y Valley um joining the group uh, and then george elliott and now uh, worcester acute worcestershire acute is the biggest trust in the group and the group in, in total is a, it's just over 1.6 billion turnover per annum so by by going up that 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 scale uh, worcester added about half a billion to our turnover we we now have the opportunity to share some of our overheads and some of our costs over a a wider base so there's some efficiency there but more importantly we tap into uh, another group of clinicians in a similar circumstances to us uh, and opportunities to learn and to share um, and um, and we've certainly seen those uh, and so just to talk about one or two things that have happened as a consequence of that um, we've we we've started to look at uh, the arrangements we have around uh, our analytics function across the group uh, uh, our digital function, and we, we'll, we're fortunate that we've got some senior experience um, in, in Worcestershire Acute that can that, that are going to help to 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 bring those skills across group. Um, we have already had a couple of our four boards meetings with Worcester Acute colleagues um, present, uh, and uh, hopefully some of our governors have the opportunity to. To witness that and to see some of the areas where um, there's opportunities for us to share and um, we have on they've onboarded into the group really quickly uh, and, and part of our approach here is to ensure that we have similar governance arrangements across groups so they've adopted the the format of our of our board and subcommittees um, they're not a foundation trust they don't have the benefit of the council of governors but otherwise they their governance arrangements are the same as ours um, and uh, and also the executive portfolios now we've aligned those broadly across groups so what that ensures is that our um, chief finance officers can get together and share their learning um, and um, and that's already been beneficial to us so so we've got a number of informal forums um, but then also one of the things I touched on earlier is the 
um, the ability to now look at that scale um, and uh, use the leverage of the bigger group to deliver better results for all trusts. And two areas that we are looking at now is a review of our fragile services. So that's looking at services that, that uh, have question marks about their clinical sustainability moving forward. Um, and then also a review of our tertiary services, um, which I just touched on a moment ago after Sarah provided a report on, on uh, uh, cancer services. Um, so we're looking at all of the arrangements that the four trusts across the group have for tertiary um, uh, and then to draw up some uh, common specifications to ensure our patients get the best deal um, and to broker the, uh, a better deal where we can with our tertiary partners. Now across group, Georgia mainly use UHCW, they have a little bit that goes into Leicester, we mainly use UHCW, Worcester Acute have a bit of UHCW, a bit of University Hospital Birmingham, um, and a bit of Gloucester uh, and Y Valley, a bit of Birmingham, a bit of Gloucester. So again, there's an opportunity to look at that and to compare and contrast and to use the leverage that that provides. So um, so that's been a, a, a useful exercise. We now have a common performance report uh, across group. And when we meet as four boards, we look at the performance and drill down into that performance in each of the four organisations. And there's always a gem or two um, from from each organisation that we can pick up and 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 ensure that we uh, we get to the bottom of why it is that it's doing better in that organisation or worse in that organisation. Um, and what I'd love to see actually is that the clinical networks are starting to happen um, across group. Uh, our urology teams, for example, without uh, any encouragement, um, have had a couple of meetings to talk about how they can work together. So um, some really positive things happening. Um, Worcestershire Acute um, has performance challenges um, and it's pretty much got the full set um, in terms of uh, urgent care, elective care, cancer performance and financial challenge. Um, but there's things that we're doing, there's things that George Elliott are doing and Y Valley are doing that they can learn from. But actually, even though it's an organisation that has challenges, there's some things that we can learn from too. Um, so together we're tackling those um, and uh, I very much hope that when I update you on this um, a little bit into the future, we're able to talk about how some of those performance uh, issues have been addressed uh, and we move forward from, as indeed we have uh, at Y Valley and at George Elliott. So, um, Russell, that's probably all I could say in terms of an overview of how that's going if that's uh, that's okay i'm happy to take any questions that's, that's super thank you glenn any questions or perspectives to glenn i know there was an anxiety in the early days from governors about the consequences of um glenn and i getting involved at worcestershire and as i said it was a case of enlightened self-interest in my view and i think over time that will prove to be the case we certainly get less ambulance um conveyancing transfers uh, from Worcestershire than we used to. Um, so we'll move on then to the Operational Assurance Status Update report. Um, and uh, Glenn, cunningly, this has got Adam's name at the bottom of it, so I'm not sure if Adam's delegated upwards or whether Glenn's going to delegate it down to Adam. Glenn? I, I, I'll do this one, although I'll thank Adam for pulling together the, the report and for the execs for their contribution to it. Um, I, I might I might pass it to one of these meetings, but but we we didn't agree that one today. So I'll, I'm happy to um, well very happy actually to present the report because it's um it's a very positive overview of where we are as an organisation. And as you said at the start of the meeting, in the context of uh, a very challenging set of circumstances, um, you, you mentioned urgent emergency care and the work of our A&E team. Um, we keep hitting new records in terms of numbers of attendances uh, in our A&E um, uh, and that also includes some ambulances coming to us from further afield because we hand over ambulances very rapidly uh, at Warwick which we're very proud of um, but credit to the teams that they managed to keep that performance up there with some of the best in as, as you say some of the best in, in the Midlands and some of the best in the NHS. Um, We've had industrial action. We uh, we've got challenges financially across the NHS, and we obviously will talk about our finances later. Um, 
but the wider financial challenge that, that uh, public sector faces has implications on demand for us, as does the, the credit crunch in the community. So, um, so these are difficult times, but as you look through um, these objectives, I won't go through all of them, um, you can see that in addition to keeping the show on the road, there's quite a lot of strategic change going on um, across the organisation. Uh, this obviously maps back to the objectives we agreed with Council of Governors at the start of the year um, and shows at this third quarter of the year um, that we're pretty much there on all of the objectives that we set. It's a couple of areas that are amber and there's an explanation for those in there. There's one red area, which I'll mention in a moment, um, but lots of green, lots of improvement in areas that we set about to improve. Um, another indicator of that actually that will come through quite soon will be um, there's a big focus here on staff, well-being, flexibility, recruitment. You will soon see in the public domain the annual staff survey for the NHS. Um, uh, it's embargoed at the moment, so I'm not allowed to smile about it, but I will be smiling about it when it comes out because there's lots of really good things in there. Um, to celebrate and, and it will show SWIFT as one of the best trusts in the NHS again and, and we still hold our segment one status uh, and we still have our outstanding rating from the CQC so lots to be proud of but also lots of things that we're still trying to improve upon. I, I won't go through everything you see some work on management uh, development, flexible working, um, the improvements in time to hire around recruitment that are signalled there, improvements in our staff turnover rates, um, some development of new roles uh, in line with the National Workforce Plan, um, the innovative work we're doing on the community recovery service in terms of improving discharge for patients into domiciliary care, um, which is one of the features as to why we're managing to maintain good performance on urgent care. Um, the um, operational project um, looking at uh, avoiding attendances where we can and, and different pathways for, for patients. Um, and um, the only red that I want to just flag with you, actually the other one before I do that is, as Russell said, um, there's a lot of change going on, on the, particularly on the Warwick side, the elective hub development is a really important strategic development for us. You can see that that's progressing well. It's not just about what we're building on site, it's what we've had to move off site in order to facilitate that build. Um, so that's been good to see. The red area is our um, electronic patient record um, project. Um, we didn't plan to implement it this year, but this year we planned to have signed up to um, the, uh, the arrangements that um, have gone through our public board um, which would be to put the CERNA system in place. The CERNA system um, was due to be implemented at University Hospitals College in Warwickshire last year and hasn't been implemented yet, um, but they are on track for an implementation in the spring. Um, and so we should soon be in a position where we can sign up to following them um, together with George Elliott to implement that new electronic patient record. So that's why that one is red. Otherwise, we've got mainly greens and a few amethysts. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions on the leave it, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Glenn, and thank you to the leadership team for all your hard work. Any questions or perspectives to Glenn, David, David G? Uh, thank you. Um, how is the trust doing with seven day working, particularly operation? Yes, so um, I mean, one of the reasons why we have good flow is that we have seven day services um, and maintain um, uh, our assessment of patients throughout uh, weekends and, and also importantly throughout the 24 hour period. Um, we our elective services mainly operate uh, over the weekdays, but um, often at weekends we're doing extra outpatient clinics or extra elective lists in order to make the progress that we report here on addressing the backlog of, of, of patients waiting and um, uh, there's, 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 there's one elective specialty where we will not have delivered on the 65 week promise this year. That is our orthodontic service uh, and that's not because we are not getting through the 
uh, the, the, the workload in the way that we have in the past is because we now have a much bigger catchment area because a lot of other parts of the NHS have stopped providing orthodontics. So, um, so I think one of the constraints to further weekend operating, David, would be um, theatre staff. They're, they're, it's quite hard to recruit and retain theatre staff. Um, and so we, you can see within here one or two initiatives that we've put in place to to address that. But um, otherwise, um, if you visit the weekends, you can see a lot of activity going on. Uh, thank you, Glenn. Thank you, David. Uh, Kelly. Right. Um, yes. Thanks, Rasso. And um, just a couple of questions. Uh, one is the leading a power organizations uh, program it does that is that uh, applies to medics or other clinical groups uh, are all can also do the training and to, uh, i have another question as well you you want me to go ahead or so sorry kelly could you repeat the, the question repeat okay yes and um, there is on um, number one objectives uh, that uh, you offer training three-day leadership program for um oh, the leo uh, uh, yeah. yes the leo that applies yeah. to medics or other groups as well that's so there are training programs for other groups leo is specifically for for nursing um staff development and um has, has been a program that's worked worked really well um but um uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've got um, some uh, leadership training for medical staff uh, that we're doing across the group. Um, so, um, so there are other disciplines being um, being trained in that way. But Leo was piloted for nursing staff. Right. And um, that training is delivered uh, um, by a, a company or other uh, or a university or uh, is it how it's done? The training, I mean, so. I think it, I mean Fiona might be able to help me on this one. I think I think it go well, go on, Fiona. Uh, well, so Leo is based on a national program, but we have um, uh, trained internal facilitators. Okay, yeah, thank you. Right, I'll go to the other question because I know it's not much time. Um, the, uh, objective number eight uh, is enhancements to internal data and information processes, um, and is that. Um, all right, and um, there is training, BI training um, has been completed, it says. Now, it, is that for people, are you changing the dashboards or it's for people to improve uh, data entries um, and analyzing data, what that involves, that BI? Um, so, th so this is to provide, this is providing uh, information to people who are, running services, managing services across the organization and the, the ability to interpret the, 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 the huge amount of data that we hold yeah. as an organization. So it's mm. how we use what we've captured. Yeah. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks. Um, and Ruth? Yeah. Um, I, be I believe a month or two ago, we'd slipped down the lead table with radiology and um, I wondered if we were back on track yeah, I mean, one of one of the so so, uh, and the reason for that was demand rather than um, our any kind of slowing down in our capacity. Um, but uh, one of the indicators of that, I think Sarah t talked about earlier, which is the faster diagnostic standard supporting cancer services. Um, many trusts are not delivering that standard. We have been delivering it for over six months now. Um, the ninety. 9% um, six uh, week wait on um, diagnostics. I think we're, we're, we're there on all specialties again now. So, so um, I think the simple answer to your question is yes, but I, I would encourage you to have a look at our performance pack uh, that goes to board, because that's where we have all of these KPIs on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you, Ruth. And, um... The, the board pack with all of that data is available to enter the public every month um, through our website. Um, if there are no other questions, we'll move on then to patient experience. And uh, Fiona. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, so um, this is our quarter two patient experience uh, report. So slightly late uh, reporting here, but it has gone 
um, obviously to um, other committees internally before it comes here. Um, it gives a, um, a summary of how we monitor patient experience in a more formal way, but obviously there's a lot of informal conversations with patients and feedback from the public in in conversations and observations that we do. But this is our the the this is how we monitor it more formally. Uh, we do that through the number of complaints we have, the more the the number of PALS contacts we have, the contacts we have with patients and relatives in their in their bereavement care, um, and um, when we are um, uh, we capture um, uh, data electronically through what we call friends and family, and also CQC do um, patient experience. With um, surveys as well periodically. The, uh, as assurance to the public, the majority of this data says that um, our um, patients have very good experience at, at SWIFT. Obviously, as the chairman suggested, we don't always get it right and we do um, uphold um, formal complaints um, after investigation um, often um, and we have actions that come from those and lessons for the team that um, are implemented um, robustly. Some of those are reflected in this report uh, but on the on the whole our experience is good compared to other organisations our formal complaints um, numbers compared to our uh, uh, patient um, numbers is, is low um, and that's why that's because we have a culture of trying to listen to patients actually whilst they are in our care and resolving those concerns before they leave. Um, happy to take any questions at all. Thank you Fiona and um, just a quick one for me what are you most worried about Fiona? Um, I'd say there's two elements um, I've, um, that what worry me. We've talked a number of times um, here today about the busyness of our um, organisations, uh, whether that's through A&E and maternity, our um, uh, outpatient um, lists and demand on um, services. And I think when we are so busy, if you're running a hospital at 110 percent and you've got a very full A&E, there is a urgency to discharge people. Um, and um, the communication can sometimes feel rushed to patients and relatives because we need to get them out with some urgency and back to their home, which is the right place for them when they don't when they're not acutely ill and they can be recovering at home. So I think that that's a very um, fine balance that our clinical teams tread every day to get that communication right. The other the other aspect I'd, I'd say concerns me is the con ongoing um, number of people that come into our services and remain in our services when they're dying. Um, and I think my um, view is that if you are members of the public, which I, I do, and our patients, the majority of them, if they knew that they were coming to their end of their life, and had had the opportunity to plan that, they would choose to have um, those last hours and days at home in their own beds. And I think we don't achieve that always. I suppose my ask to the public is encourage yourself, your relatives, um, your friends to have those conversations and plan what you would prefer to happen at the end of your life. Um, as you would your finances, um, because it's equally important. No, thank you, Fiona. Wise words. Any questions or perspectives to Fiona? <laughs> okay, I can't see any digital hands raised. Uh, please thank all of your senior team, uh, Fiona, for the hard work uh, they do. Um, so we'll move on then to the clinical governance assurance support. Uh, David Spraggart has had to send his apologies, but uh, Pramjit, on his behalf, um, what would you like to pull out? Thank you, Chair, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think it's, I'll take the uh, report as read, but just to reinforce what you and Glenn said earlier on about the pressures. Now, this report was um, October of last year. The Trust was going into the winter pressures and preparing for them. 
on top of that, we've had the extra pressures going on. And, you know, it's great to see that trust with all the staff has maintained excellent service uh, throughout this period. So I think that's to be commended. And the report is as read. There were some items that uh, were concerning us at that particular time, you know, going back uh, retrospectively, particularly the postpartum hemorrhage, for example. High rates at about five to six percent. But, you know, with the effort which the staff undertook during this pressurized period, that's reduced dramatically to two percent, you know, which is a significant fall, substantial. So that's, you know, they should be commended on that. And uh, the hematology backlog was also of a concern. But again, through working together, all together, there's been significant progress made. And the inequities in oncology, which Sarah has alluded to, um, that's on track as well now. And again, Fiona has mentioned the end of life care. That was again troubling us at the governance meeting. But, you know, things are on track here, Chair and the governor. So, you know, nothing's perfect, but we are striving to be excellent in everything that we do. So, you know, uh, both the staff should be commended uh, on the efforts that they've put in. Fantastic. Thank you, Brandit, and thank you uh, for uh, that summary report. Any questions um, to um, the Clinical Governance uh, Committee and uh, Brandit as its representative? Um, and Callie? Yes, um, a very quick uh, question regarding the palliative care annual report. <clears throat> it states there that, um, I, I don't know, um, the, there is an, an ICB end of life care strategy and there, there's going to be um, sort of individual plans for yeah. all the members of the ICB, the member trust of the ICB. Um, so um, how far this has progressed? Because uh, the way I read it is that it's trust need to do their own, have their own plans in place and any developments on that. That's yeah, Fiona? Yeah, happy to uh, respond to that. So the ICB has um, in the last two weeks published uh, their end of life strategy. So we are um, as a group of providers and commissioners just digesting that and, and um, taking the next steps in terms of planning what how we operationalise that. So that should be published on the ICB website, but I'm happy to share it with you if you can't find it, Callie. Yeah, thanks, Fiona. Thank you. Thanks, Fiona. I mean, it should, it should be mentioned that SWIFT is one of the um, exemplars in terms of its uh, help to the frail elderly, um, which is obviously slightly behind of life, but you know, our focus on ensuring, as you maybe have heard me say before, that we bring life safely into the world, but we also help life leave the world with dignity is very important. And it's probably worth me thanking our chaplaincy and our volunteers who do phenomenal work uh, with the frail elderly and those at end of life um, within the trust, uh, as well as our community teams. Um, we'll move on then to the finance assurance uh, part of the um, meeting. Uh, Kim, things are very difficult, challenging, as well as complicated as ever in NHS finance land. How are you seeing things? Uh, thank you, Chair. It is complicated and uh, challenging, I think it's fair to say. Um, I think uh, since the last Council of Governors uh, report, a couple of things have happened. So if I just uh, highlight those key things uh, before I talk about the month nine position. So since the, uh, the last um, um, quarter, a couple of announcements were made. We managed to secure our share of our winter uh, pressures uh, money. Uh, and uh, we also got a share of the £800 million pounds that was released nationally. Now, you may recall that that some of the money that was released nationally was effectively Treasury raided, raiding other pots of money that had been allocated to the NHS. So it wasn't new money, it was effectively recycled uh, money. So that obviously had an impact on uh, some of the other kind of uh, funding streams that we were hoping to, to access. 
our share of that uh, 800 million uh, was about 1.6 million and that was supposed to effectively contribute to the cost of industrial action that had taken place uh, by that uh, time uh, by by um, I think it was November actually to so theoretically it was to cover the cost incurred uh, to that point it didn't uh, at no point really really cover the true cost that we had incurred as an organization but it did help contribute uh, towards those costs but the, the there was a condition attached to getting a share of that money and that was for organizations to effectively resubmit their plans uh, by, by the end of november and for us uh, the ask was to deliver a break even position by the end of the financial year um, after you know a lot of scrutiny, uh, emptying off the coffers, shaking uh, the trees, and discussion at board, we did sign off a plan to uh, deliver a break-even uh, position by the end of this financial year. Although we did make it very clear uh, nationally and to the region that we would not be able to mitigate the cost of any further strike action. Uh, subsequent to that sign off uh, by the end of November, uh, unfortunately, there were further strike action that took place in uh, December and January and uh, now obviously the announcement of further strike action in February. Uh, and as I said, we've reiterated that we are unable to um, mitigate the, the, the cost of that. So we are now effectively forecasting a deficit a position um, you know, uh, uh, you know, excluding the February strikes of about one point two million pounds. Having said that, the month nine position did show an improving um, position from the uh, reported position back in um, month uh, six. So we are reporting for month nine a three and a half million pound uh, deficit. Uh, some of that is to uh, reflective of the improving position on agency that it was the third month in a row that we saw a, a reduction in our agency spend so that's a testament really to the efforts really for all of the staff involved in managing and controlling and reducing that agency spend particularly in the light of the operational pressures and the industrial action uh, that we were uh, also uh, managing really so thank you everybody really to to, to ensure that we're keeping grip really off the finances in the light of the challenges that we we were also uh, facing um so so the month nine position was three and a half million pound deficit we you know we we also had to release some uh, you know balance sheet um uh, you know flexibility to 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 ensure really that we're showing that uh that improving uh, run rate but we have got a challenge with m managing really the cost of further industrial uh, action uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight really was capital. You, you'll see we've got an ambitious capital program this year of 4.8, uh, 40, sorry, not 4.8, 40.8 uh, million pound uh, capital program. Uh, and the estates uh, department uh, obviously have been working very hard and you'll see that reflective with the works on the site at the moment. However, it does look like we're likely to slip some expenditure uh, uh, and the report alludes to, to that. And we're currently looking at ways on how we can protect the funding uh, uh, of that and carry it forward into next year. And, uh, um, you know, so, so I think Glenn's going to brief uh, council governors in the confidential se section uh, later in a bit more uh, detail. Um, the other update is planning. So we normally have planning guidance uh, issued, usually it's a, a Christmas present, so it's usually issued on Christmas Eve uh, for us. Uh, this year they sent a letter to say, sorry, but we're not going to give you uh, the planning guidance and it's going to come um, in, in drips and drabs. The latest we've heard is that uh, the final guidance is expected to be released in March. In the meantime, we're working through a draft guidance in terms of key kind of assumptions um, of, of what that looks like for next year. Uh, and we're just working through that at the moment. The key things is that block contracts are likely to stay. Uh, they're still planning on kind of a, P a PBR, payment by results approach for elective work. 
and um, uh, but it's black cash, so it's going to be really challenging, really uh, moving forward. But as I said, we're in the early discussions at the moment with the ICB in terms of uh, getting our, you know, working out what our share of the allocation is. And uh, we're having internal uh, discussions with our divisions in terms of managing cost pressures and discussing uh, the cost improvement target for uh, next year. Uh, we've got a draft plan that we will uh, bring back to the uh, for board for discussion uh, early March. Happy to take questions, Chair. Thank you, Kim. So at its simplest, are we, is your view we're going to break even this year given the way we're able to handle things at year end? Yes. Thank you. Um, so questions or perspectives. Um, uh, Roger? Uh, yes. Um, Kim, CPIP is behind uh, the trajectory that you would like. Is this a symptom that having had CPIPs for a number of years, all the low hanging fruit has been uh, gathered in. Uh, the difficult ones are, are also uh, done. And now we're into the impossibility if we want to keep on uh, delivering an excellent service for patients. Any cuts in from CPIP would uh, bite into uh, that delivery. We've been, yeah. that, we've been saying that for years, Roger, to be honest. Um, I think I'm in my ninth year as, as chair. We've been saying that type of thing for years. There's always, always productivity opportunities. Um, Glenn, sorry, Kim, did you want to ask? Should we give it to Glenn? No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. I, I would agree. I mean, it, it's obviously a challenge. You know, there's always there's there, there's always something else, you know, to, to look at and opportunities. You know, that's the challenge, isn't there, really? Uh, and that's partly why we work in a group because actually there may be things elsewhere that we haven't thought of. So we we need to make sure that we're we're challenging ourselves. Uh, but we are, you know, it is a, you know, we're trying to balance off those those difficult conversations around managing our operational pressures and maintaining safety as well as delivering on the money. Yeah, no, well said, Kim. Uh, Glenn. Yeah, um, Kim is absolutely right. I mean, there there, there are always opportunities. One of the things that does get more, that is more difficult now than it was a few years ago is a few years ago payment by results covered all aspects of our activity so if we did more urgent care activity we we got paid for it um now that is uh within a block contract <clears throat> so there is um so that increasing demand and those new record numbers of attendances i referred to earlier no extra money comes with that uh so there's quite a bit of our what a big bit we do isn't subject to uh activity income adjustments no absolutely and um just to support glenn my, my view is that we should get paid for what we do not block contracts have got their place in certain situations but in terms of our core activities we should get paid for what we do it then provides us with an incentive to do more um andrew andrew wilkins with your forbearance as you're uh, a, a, a member and a member of the public uh, we do questions for members of the public and members at the end of the meeting um so with your forbearance can i ask you to hold on to your question and we'll come back to you later um we'll move on then, um, if there's nothing else for Kim from Governors, to the Audit Assurance Report. Richard? Thank you. Uh, just, just picking up on the comments in the chat box from Kim, I think some of the CPIP is getting very difficult in those areas like ED that are working so hard, they've got no, no room to breathe. So time to spend time thinking about CBITs and some of those departments is getting very heavy and and things like so they're going by the wayside and also Kim hasn't mentioned that there's probably about two three million of work we're doing in 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 uh, uh, which we're not getting refunded from the ICB in that uh, when we're trying to get to break even things like the the uh, uh, diabetes kits we're not getting paid for any longer and we've got the, the 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 extra beds in Leamington Hospital we're not getting funded by the ICB so there's quite a bit there so coming to the audit and assurance uh, very very briefly um, uh, 
lots of work's been done on the sea on on looking at the contract system and there's a migration to our uh, atomis so that's ongoing so we've got a new dashboard that looks at all the major contracts uh in the system um about in uh uh, February 2023, we moved to a new system of new recruits in uh, for the for Swift went on to probationary period. So rather than doing all the checks right up front, we went on to probationary period. And there were a couple of teething problems. Uh, we had an internal audit report, and it's uh, it now we now know that that's all working. So if anybody comes in, the checks haven't been done, all the controls are in place. Um, a septic control, uh, stock control has been an issue in aseptics. That is ongoing. Uh, we were going to deal with it uh, this week in, in uh, the audit committee to understand what's going on. That will now come to the April meeting. But it's a lot of lot of thought, a lot of progress, a lot of input from uh, uh, executive teams and NEDs are going into it. So we'll get to the right solution. Thank you very much, Richard. Any questions or perspectives to Richard? OK, thank you, Richard, and thank you thank for you. everyone's involvement on the audit committee. And we then move on to the uh, reports from governor representatives on projects and groups. And I think this part of the agenda always illustrates just how uh, many areas our governors get involved in. So I do thank all governors um, for their uh, very hard work on behalf of other uh, citizens. Um, but we'll take the reports as read. So. Um, on the Community Diagnostic um, Centre project update, um, I will take that as read. Um, are the, I'm not sure Mike Flaxman is with us today. Mike, you're in our thoughts. Any questions though on that update from Mike? Please raise a digital hand. Okay, exciting things coming down the line with that CDC, that's for sure. The Elective Hub project update. Um, Andy? Uh, yes, thanks very much, Russell. This is uh, on behalf of Graham Nuttall. Um, a couple of points he wanted to make. The new or official department is located in Car Park J. Uh, it became operational on Monday, the 15th of January. Uh, the Cardiac Investigation Unit became operational Monday, the 5th of February. Uh, the clinical element of the dermatology surface is relocated to the former Keith Lee suite, um, and it was done on the 3rd of February and then became operational on the 5th. And uh, the new cycle shelter and shower facility in the car park C opened um, on January the 18th. And then finally, uh, Stepsnells have installed a, a freeze frame camera in car park A to show the progress of the um, demolition that's going on. And that's it briefly. Okay, thank you very much, Andy. Any questions or perspectives to Andy on the elective hub work, which anyone visiting the hospital site will see in its full complicated glory. Okay, thank you. And if I could ask you to go back onto mute, that would be super. So we'll move on then to another area where there's lots of work going on, which is the Ellen Badger hospital site. Mike Wells. Thanks, Russell. I'll take the report as read. Um, it was written a couple of weeks ago. So since then, um, had a site visit on the 5th of February for the project board and the Star Health and Wellbeing Partnership representatives. So that was very uh, interesting and exciting to actually get on each of the different floors and see what's going on. All the windows are in, insulations all going in. Um, and then we had a meeting afterwards on site in the retained building uh, to talk about the partnerships um, development strategy, which Sophie is keen to support. Um, I suppose the other exciting thing is that as part of starting to get ready to commission the health and wellbeing hub element, um, we're having a professional partners meeting in March um, where people who will be actively involved in delivering services in, in the building will actually get together and start to talk about how they butt up to each other rather than overlap or have gaps. So good. Super, thanks Mike. And I'm not sure if you took the uh, building shots, uh, which is in, uh, included in your report, but they really help bring it alive. Um, any questions to Mike on the Ellen Badger redevelopment? 
OK, uh, I think we have apologies from Michael Coker, but the end of life uh, committee report. Um, are there any questions on the end of life committee report? I would just like to reinforce the point I think um, Fiona made earlier about uh, one thing we can all be sure of is we're all going to meet end of life. I've certainly made sure my rules are written, uh, the way I want my funeral arranged. Um, I've put in place powers of attorney attorney and um, I am in the process of writing a living will so it is just um, an act of kindness almost to your loved ones to put all of that stuff in place so I really would encourage members of the public uh, and also just in terms of uh, people who are um, frail and elderly in our community um, it, it means the world often if you're a widow or a widower or you've always um, lived alone, to have a, a word of kindness or a smile or a knock on the door to uh, check you're doing OK. Um, so let's make sure as a group of individuals, we try and look after one another. Um, uh, Callie, your hand went up as I was speaking. Uh, yes, thanks, Russell. Um, yes, we all have to do all these things, but it comes down to many other things, isn't it? The dignified death, etc. Now, uh, there's a couple of things um, that I noticed in this report. And my, my, my one question that I, uh, is, but I, I don't fully understand this sentence that uh, talks about a uh, supportive and palliative care indicators tool. Uh, so all teams, is that all clinical teams need to have in place this tool? Uh, and what fast track discharge means uh, that fast track discharge needs further attention? I, I, I don't fully understand this sentence um, regarding this toolkit and fast track discharge um, and, um, and and also there is an issue with recruiting staff for palliative the palliative care team but that that that's all I noticed from this report so there are a couple of things there but my question is regarding these indicators too and fast track discharge I don't understand it sorry Okay, Kelly, I'm struggling. Maybe I'm a bit blind seeing that in Michael's report. Um, it is the third sentence, uh, end of life committee report, third sentence, third paragraph. It was further emphasised that we were trying to embed the tool into all teams. That's what Sarah, it said. No. Fiona? Yeah, I can help with this. So, um, the supportive and palliative care indicator tool is a assessment of um, uh, people's uh, life expectancy um, and that is to help families to identify and, and people to, uh, um, to think about actually you may be in the last couple of years of your life. Um, it's a evidence based tool that has come from Scotland. It's been a, in in um, circulation for some time, but we haven't always used it to the best effect in the hospital. So we are trying to use it to help families to to have some sort of prediction of their, um, the, the time that people have left so that they can have those preparatory conversations. So that's what that is. It's a predictive tool. It's um, predictive. Okay. I, I have to say it's not in my report, which is uh, slightly <laughs> um, uh, arresting because I can't I can't see any reference to it. Kelly, can I suggest um, you um, pick it up with uh, Fiona in for more detail for Michael in Michael's absence? OK, thank you. Um, but I, I think more generally, you know, helping families understand when we're all in the last thousand days, which we all inevitably will get to, just seems to me to be um, absolutely the type of thing we should be helping families to um, realise when um, we're in our last thousand days, if we're able to be that predictive. Um, Glenn? Yeah, it's, it's because there are two reports, Chairman, one from the 14th of November, one from the 11th of January. It was in the first. Ah, OK, I tell you, you can't trust. Thank you, Glenn. Yes, I see it now. OK, uh, thank you, Kelly. Uh, Fiona will follow that up. Um, any other questions on the um, end of life uh, committee? 
Um, so we'll move on then to the Falls Prevention Steering Group. Uh, David? David G, are you on mute, my friend? Sorry, right, it's off now. Um, yeah, I'll take it as read, unless there are any questions, please. Thank you very much, David. Any questions to David? Um, Mary? Uh, my question was actually, sorry, um, Chair, my question was, uh, was a comment about palliative care. But okay, can we know. come back to that in just a second? Hold on to that thought then, Mary. Any questions to David? Okay, Mary, did you want to go come back on palliative care? Uh, yeah, just to, to comment that at the Medicines Oversight Committee, um, I'm sure they said that the Outer Hospital uh, team have done a piece of exercise and come up with palliative care and pain control as a key theme to work on. So just to, to tell um, council governors that there is a big piece of work being done on that. Yeah, and certainly that's something over the years Fiona and I have talked about and talked about with commissioners because it is a genuine issue at um, end of life to be able to access the drugs to ensure that we're able to leave the world with dignity and not, not in pain. So thank you, Mary, for the work you're doing on that. Colleagues, happy to move on? to the Medicine, Safety and Oversight Committee and with perfect timing. Uh, Mary? Yes, me again. Um, you know, I take it as very, except we do want to just pull out a couple of points. I mentioned the P-Serve for um, um, out of hospital. They've also done a piece of work and identified a theme around medicines and missing, missing medication and missed doses. Um, as considered a, a major th cause of incidents and is now a, a theme which they will be working on and there's a, <clears throat> um, a plan in, being put in place. Um, I also wanted to highlight that the, the um, committee felt that they needed more engagement with the matrons and ward managers and more of a two-way communication so they're reviewing their terms of reference and that's a similar situation, similar discussions that we've had at the Patient Care Committee, the Governor's Subcommittee. Um, of interest to um, uh, governors who've discussed this quite a lot is that they've got, there's going to be a dedicated ward pharmacy technician uh, will meet monthly with the uh, ward managers to support housekeeping of control drugs. So that's it. And, and that they've identified the need for more medicines management training provided by pharmacists um, and so they'll be engaging with the pharmacy team to uh, as I say provide more medicines management training um, and uh, support the nursing training team in that respect. Um, otherwise that, that it was a, I thought it was a very good progressive meeting actually. Great thank you Mary and thank you for that feedback. Any questions or perspectives to Mary? OK, we'll then move on to the patient experience group. Uh, Sharon, what would you like to pull out of your report? Um, basically, um, the rep I have sent the paperwork through, but if everybody wants me to, to read through the report briefly, is there anything? No, we'll, we'll take it as read, Sharon. But is there anything you want to add? No, does anybody ask, ask, have any questions for me? OK, any yeah. questions to Sharon? No, OK, okay. thank you. So, thank you, Sharon. Um, we'll move on then to patient letters, personalisation and M-STAR modal working group. Uh, Mike, on behalf of Pat. Yeah, thanks, Russell. Uh, M-modal is the toolkit they use, apparently. So, um, no, I, I take uh, Pat's report as read um, and this team meets on a weekly basis, which if you've read the report, you'll have a twig. So that's an incredible level of commitment from Pat that I'd like to say thank you for. No, absolutely, Mike. And I'm aware all my all the governors uh, generally work extremely hard and I, I'm very appreciative of it. Any, any questions on Pat's report, which Mike is um, standing in on? OK, and that moves us on nicely into, if you like, the future patient portal engagement form. Uh, Roger? Uh, yes. The, um take the um, the report as read um, but because governors had a training session on this on the 17th of January I would however um, draw your attention to paragraph six where the future um, the future development of this 
is almost on hold until the um, electronic patient record uh, solution is sorted out. Lorenzo, which we currently use, can't take things further forward. The new EPR needs to, but until we know what everyone's trying to uh, plug into, um, it's a bit of a uh, bit of pause. Thank you, Roger. Adam, is there anything you'd like to add to uh, what Roger said before I go to questions? Uh, no, nothing specific, Russell, I, 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 other than saying we've reviewed take up of the patient portal recently and we've still got very high sign up numbers and I think we've had some really positive feedback from people who are using it. So uh, I, I agree we're, we're, we're held back from doing more until we get the new EPR, but um, we are making good use of it in its current form. OK, great. Thank you, Adam. Um, any other questions or perspectives to Roger? So we'll move on then to Patient um, Safety Surveillance Committee. Um, uh, Sue is unwell today, um, so we'll have to pass over on that. I, I apologise. Um, so we'll get an update from Sue next time. And we'll move therefore on to the Radiation Protection Committee. Um, uh, Carolyn, anything you'd particularly like to pull out of your report? Just, uh, I just want to know, I'm trouble with computer. Can you see me? Can you hear me? I uh, can hear you and see you in your full glory. Oh, um, my God, how lovely. Um, not especially, except to say, uh, first of all, this is only my third meeting there because they only come on to quarter. I'm still getting to grips with all the technology. But what uh, is very clear is the professionalism, the expertise and the dedication of all the staff. And uh, I'd like to give tri tribute to that because, in a sense, they're putting themselves in danger because of the uh, danger of, of radiation, but they keep themselves as safe as they can. So uh, it's a, um, a pleasure and an honour to be part of, uh, to observe that committee. But otherwise, oh, just to say that they were a little bit sniffy about the new national guidelines, said that there was nothing in it for them. <laughs> I'll leave it there. Oh, sorry, if there are any questions, I'll answer yeah. them if I can. If not, I'll I'll go back to them and answer it on the next occasion. So any non-sniffy questions to Carolyn? <laughs> OK, thank you, Carolyn. Thank you for your involvement. Um, the Safer Discharge Group, there's uh, nothing to report, so we'll pass over on that. And we'll move then on to the Salix Project Board. Um, uh, John, anything you'd like to add to your report? Uh, no, there's nothing I'd like to add. I think it's a, a sensible project. You must remember this is not to save money. It's basically on the direction of zero carbon. Um, it actually adds a little bit of cost, and, but it is a sensible project. It's in the right direction. I would advise, however, that for cold weather work, we ought to start looking at ground source heat pumps because um, uh, over in a city, in a town, you actually do have higher temperatures and we ought to examine a ground source heat pump uh, solution. No, no, thanks, John. Um, we've done a lot of work on ground source heat pumps elsewhere, Glenn. Yeah, I was going to say that, Russell, that we've got some experience at Y Valley. In fact, although much of the, so we put ground source heat pumps across the, the county site in, in Y Valley, but um, a lot of the air source heat, heat pumps have moved on from a technology perspective and the evaluation that the special ad advisors that we used uh, gave on that uh, did advise us to go for, for, for air source at this point but um, because the installation charges of a ground source are, uh, are slightly higher but but we keep looking at those options and the technology as it changes. Thank you John, thank you Glenn. Um, the Serious Incident Review Group, Cal is attending the first meeting um, uh, later on this week or next week rather so thank 20th you 20th of feb sorry yeah thank you callie so look forward to hearing about that next time um so we'll move on then to the wayfinding strategy group update um roger uh i think this is uh basically straightforward um it overlaps in uh to a, a minor extent with the elective hub because of course um guiding people round uh, the demolition works and in, back into the hospital is um, is fundamental. Um, the next uh, item that we're looking at very much is paragraph 10, the living maps pilot, so that once 
everything is done and sorted, um, we want to make it much easier for people to find their way around the hospital, not least because various things will have moved. Um, perhaps also item seven um, is an important one for members of the public. Um, if a department has a named building or a named facility, that name stays with that department regardless of where the department physically is, just to, just to make life slightly difficult. So the Keith Lee Suite has moved from where it was. The Jefferson Building now is where the old Keith Lee uh, Suite was, as an example. So um, the name will stay. So your appointment letter is right, but the physical position may, may move. Yeah, I thank you for any questions. And I, I think the the, uh, the living map work, which I've had a demonstration of, I think is fantastic. But the issue of wayfinding is is a very real issue for people visiting a hospital. Often one's anxious, um, maybe a, a little bit um, confused in the moment. So wayfinding is disproportionately important to as as part of, if you like, the, the patient or customer experience. So, Roger, thank you for your work on this. I know Adam's involved behind the scenes as well. Um, any questions to Roger? OK, um, so we'll um, move. Can I, can I just mention that um, many patients and visitors in the hospital find it difficult to get out. Please read the signs. Um, great effort is being made to point to the right exits. Yeah, the hospital is not the Hotel California where you can check out any time you like, but you can never leave. And um, we should make sure that patients and families can leave when they need to. Um, we'll move on then to governance matters. And the first is the GPC uh, draft minutes on the 11th of January, which will take us red. But Mike, anything you wanted to pull out? Thanks, Russell. It's just a couple of items. One is the Council of Governors self-assessment, where only half of the governors actually uh, fed back on how they think we're doing. Um, I'd really like to see that improve next time. And the governor training programme, there's a few items listed in there, but if as we go through the year, new topics come up and, and new stuff is required, please do identify it and uh, we'll get it sorted. Uh, thank you, Mike. Um, I, I would just on that point on the self-assessment like to thank Andy Petros, Carolyn, David G, Emma Polgate, Jane Knight, John Egan, Kathy Wagstaff, Mary Malloy, Mike Flaxman, Mike Wells, Pat Scott, Roger Lloyd, Sophie Black, Sue Warner for filling out um, that self-assessment. Um, greatly appreciated. Any questions to Mike? OK, thank you, Mike. So um, we move on then to the Membership and Engagement Committee draft minutes, uh, which are to be taken as read, um, given Mike Flaxman is with us. Um, any questions on those? I'll ask colleagues just to make sure they're all on mute for me, please. Um, OK, so we'll move on then to the Patient Care Committee report and approved minutes of the 13th of November the 11th of December and the draft of the 8th of January. Andy, anything you'd like to put out on these? Um, I'd just like to, yes, thank you very much, Russell. I just wanted to emphasise the sad loss of Jeff Rain, who uh, had been a member of the government for about 11 years. Uh, people would have known him, I suspect. Um, and then the other thing I wanted to highlight is, and recognise was the uh, hard work that our volunteers do in taking TTOs to patients at all sorts of times, day or night. And I just wanted to recognise their work. Um, um, also wanted to recognise the work that Jean had done by getting information on strokes, um, stroke times uh, from the ICB. It was a hard slog for her, but she did manage to get some useful information. Um, and then finally, um, she also managed to undertake an audit last year of the a and &E attendance. And we were wondering, as part of the committee, and perhaps that could come to that as any other business, whether the governors might like to suggest another audit, because Jean has got one uh, on outpatients. Uh, those are just the points. Thank you, Russell. No, that's great. Thank you, Andy. Uh, Jean, if we can pick up on that ICB point, maybe under uh, points from governors at the end. Um, any questions uh, to Andy on what Andy has covered? 
OK, thank you very much, Andy. Um, then we'll move on. We can't actually cover the um, annual review of committee terms of reference because we're not quad. So, so we'll come back to that next time, won't we? We will, thank you. But the report on resignation and appointment of governors, Sarah? Happy to take the report as read and um, invite any questions. Thank you. OK, that's uh, great. Thank you, Sarah. Any questions or perspectives to Sarah? Any other business from colleagues? Jean, do you want to cover the point you were making uh, or, you know, in terms of the ICB stroke, but after John, because John has raised on any other business? Um, John? There's been a few points where we've talked of end of life, and it's this that I'd like to talk about. I've been working for some time with the hospice movement, and I must say we've all together done a very good job of doing the best thing of all is allowing people to die at home. And if I were to tell you over the last four months, we've had 13 average, 14 average people dying at home every month. So great success. Well, let me come to the second best method if you don't die at home is to die in the hospice. I think the hospice movement have got a very good grasp on what a good death looks like. And I have to say in the quietude of a small hospice, people do get a pretty good end of life. And the problem I'm going to point out today is that at Swift, only half of the people who'd like to die in a hospice actually end up in the hospice. And there's two reasons for this. The palliative care committee have to decide they can go to the hospice. But secondly, might and hospice here um, have half the beds available, but they don't have the money to man them. And so there really aren't enough beds there to allow an even flow of people from the hospital to the hospice. Uh, so th there's only half, by the way, of the people wanting a hospice death right now from Swift are actually having a hospice death. And I wonder whether there's a way that we can work to see whether it's more cost effective and patient centric to allow them to dive in to die in the hospice by us helping the hospice to increase its capacity. They do have eight beds that they would be able to make available for this purpose at Might and Hospice. And I wonder whether we can go forward on this. I believe, Glenn, that you're having a meeting with, the, with Might and Hospice at the end of February. And I'm just urging everybody to think about all of this and try to put our minds towards what's the best for the patient. And the best for the patient is if they want a hospice death to actually arrange that they can have it. So that's my item of any other business. Thank, thank you, John. Um, Adam, did you want to come in? Because I know you've done some work on this. Yes, if I could. Thank you, Russell. So if, thank you, John. Um, I, I met Ruth. Freeman, obviously chief exec at Mighton uh, yesterday evening to discuss this very issue. And, and I think we're very supportive of the principle of, um, of opening more hospice beds. The challenge is, of course, the funding to do that in a, in a system where we, we know there are financial challenges. We, um, we discussed some potential routes for that and, and actually some potential routes to reduce the costs potentially so we could make a more affordable package um, for, um, for opening those beds. And I think we've got a bit more work to do there and we'll do that over the, the, um, the next month or so. But in principle, we are, we are very happy to support that case to open, um, open more beds and we'll continue to work on that. You've just muted yourself, John. I, I, I would like to also point out that I will try to raise the money, any capital costs in terms of opening those, the beds, I'll try to, to raise that. No, th thank you, John. Um, uh, so just before I come to Jean, but I, do, I don't want to spend the next 10 minutes talking about 
hospice beds. But Roger, did you want to make a point on hospice beds? No, Russell, I, okay. I, I've got a, got a different different point. And Kelly, did you want to make a point on hospice beds? Uh, no, I have to make a point. I wanted to make a point on end of life care and cancer services. Um, and okay. that's, we'll come, come, that's come back to that in a second. So uh, thank you, John. Thank you, Adam. And um, Jean, could you give a quick summary of uh, what your work was with the ICB on stroke, just so everyone is aware? Jean, can you hear me? Thank you. She just flashed up that she microphone's gone, the sound's gone. OK, uh, Jean, we'll have to do it another time because we can't hear you. Um, I'll move then to Roger. Roger? Uh, yes, my uh, my concern relates to TTOs, uh, the fact that um, throughout the various reports, we've been given the impression that these don't take very long to uh, produce from the pharmacy point of view, but there seems to be a logistics problem of getting them from the pharmacy to the ward to the patient. And the disastrous position could be the patient leaving uh, the site without the TTOs, when in some cases um, it, it's medically required that they take doses at a, uh, a regular and routine uh, time frame. Um, what's 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 the answer? What can can we clear the um, logistics um, uh, blockage? So again, just keeping the pace moving, Glenn. Yeah, obviously, there's a number of processes involved there. Uh, it isn't always as reported. Um, making sure they're being written up in the first place by by the medical team is often one of the things that we find is an issue. But in terms of getting the the TTOs from pharmacy to the wards, our volunteers are brilliant at that, and that's one of the services that that uh, our volunteer team have been able to expand uh, over the last few years, and I, I hope will continue to do so. So that's that's a a, a very effective use of volunteering. Um, but but we hear what you're saying, Roger. Uh, Kelly, you put your hand down. Did you want to come back in? OK, um, I don't want to keep you long, but it's not um, end of life care. It's not just hospices and uh, because yeah. people um, uh, there is a very good report. Uh, whoever works or uh, every clinician should be aware of this report. Uh, it was written in 2015, one chance to get it right. It's a 150 pages report. The issue, uh, the key issues that are identified in this report, in it, it has to, to do with um, uh, that end of life care is not properly scrutinized, care pathways um, are not well defined, et cetera, et cetera. There's loads of issues in end of life care. Um, and th whatever these report identified are still a problem. So it's not just hospices, it's loads more that have yeah. to do with end of life care. That's all um, I wanted to say. And also with a got rid of the Liverpool care pathway, which wasn't good enough. And there are there are, there is a good um, a new approach to deal with end of life care, but whether it's being implemented, it's an issue. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so I think yeah. I'll let Glenn come in in just a second, but that 2015 report, I think, has been the bedrock of a lot of our work. Our investment in palliative care consultants is amongst the very best in the Midlands. So I think a number of your comments, Kelly, would be generally true about other bits of the NHS, but I, I don't fully accept um, about um, uh, SWIFT. Uh, Glenn, is there anything you'd like to add? I mean, Kelly, Kelly's right that it's a complex issue and obviously um, the attitude of, of, of the public towards um, dying at home is one of the elements of all of this. Our hospice at home services across the patch are also delivered by our colleagues in, 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 um, in Mighton and Shakespeare Hospice and Shipston Home Care. Uh, and we, we work really closely with, with all of them in this. And one of the things that will, will help this moving forward is the community integrator contract that we've talked about at board, where we will 
we will be more responsible as, a, as an organisation, as the as the coordinator and the commissioner of those services. And that's why these conversations we're having with, with our hospice sector locally are really important. Thank you. And uh, finally, David, then I'll go to questions from members of the public. David. Thank you. Um, a point I've raised several times in the past. There was recently a report issued which said, I think it was something like 20% of the elderly do not have access to the internet or other electronic devices. But the NHS and SWIFT are still churning out projects which are not internet accessible. Now, with the other figure I've found, 40% of patients in hospitals generally are over 65. This is a massive potential area which is just not being properly catered for. It's, you can't say that you can provide this that, and that for them. They just don't have it, or if they had it, they wouldn't be able to handle it. So what is realistically being done about this, please? Yeah, I mean, there's lots of work. You know, it's not as though all of our work is about digital, David, for our, our patients. There's a lot of work that goes on even in the um, groups that we've been talking about to try and ensure that for uh, patients, or, uh, whether it's elderly or younger who don't have access to the internet, that they're still able to access um, our services and uh, information. Adam, is there anything you'd like to add? No, I don't think I've got any more to add to that. That's okay. Right. I, I do want to move on, but uh, John, do you want to come back in again? Just a very quick one on um, the use of internet. There is a, an organisation which helps elderly people to get onto the internet, and uh, it's called the Cool Breeze Technology Services, and they are they've got a, a wide number of customers here in Warwick. So if you ever need any help, David, Cool Breeze will be able to uh, add you into the internet. But uh, I, and I think we should really realise that for older people, these. Um, these consultancies are very, very important because there's so much more going on the internet that we really do need this help. Yeah, no, thank you, John. Thank you, David. Um, so any questions from members of the public? Um, Andrew Wilkins, I think you wanted to ask a question earlier. Do you want to come in now? Or have I lost Andrew? Andrew? I think, um, okay, so, I, uh, Russell, sorry, I answered the question on the chat. OK, so I didn't realise that. That's um, all right, yeah. yeah. Um, can, can we make sure, though, that we do things for minute purposes? Otherwise, there's an issue um, that the minutes won't be picked up off of the chat. I Elizabeth? Yeah, so I was, I was just going to say about, um, thanks, Russell, I was just going to say about it, it isn't just the elderly and uh, every every group that I sit on within SWIFT, I talk about it's all ages. 14% um, of the population now are not connected to the internet, don't want to be, won't ever be, and we can't <laughs> make them. Um, and, you know, I hear what John says about groups helping, but people don't, and we can't make them. And, you know, I am across a lot of your groups. And I remind you all that, you know, it isn't just the internet. Um, We've got to find, and it's difficult to find the balance, but, you know, we're, we're doing our best, but it isn't just the elderly. Thank uh, you. What well said, um, Elizabeth. Uh, Glenn? Yeah. Hi, Elizabeth. Nice to see you, and thanks for the work that you do to help us on, on all of this. Um, yes, I mean, we, we continue to have a number of routes of access into the organisation. I, I get complaints about sending letters when we could be contacting people via the internet and I get complaints the other way around as well. So so we we, we must make sure that, that we are not introducing digital um, inequalities um, to, to, to the population that, that we serve and that we have other routes and other support. And that's one of the reasons why we, we've gone into areas like social prescribing actually where we can we, where we can involve other agencies in helping us to communicate and to help patients to access services but um, but continue to keep us in check with some of these things because it, it's very true that as we evolve a lot of technology there is a danger we could leave people behind and we, we absolutely don't want to do that. 
Um, any other questions from members of the public? OK, that's fine. So um, I'd just like to thank everyone for joining us. Lovely to see members of the public with us. Uh, we'll now adjourn for um, a confidential um, uh, meeting, but uh, my suggestion is we therefore meet again at quarter to four on the other meeting link. So look forward to seeing you there again. Thank you to governors. Thank you particularly to frontline teams for everything you're doing um, and to the executive teams for all their hard work. See you at quarter to four. Bye-bye.